righty. Welcome back, everyone. Come on back in and settle in for our next speaker. Um, I feel like I always say I'm excited to introduce the next person, but it actually is true. Like, I've <laughs> been excited for every single speaker. Um, so next up is Dr. Deborah Sheldon. Is, she's a physical therapist and consultant. Through Deborah Joy LLC, she provides expertise to tech companies and organizations to optimize their approach to pain, product development, and care provision. You can be up here for this. Sure. This is Deborah. Uh, <laughs> she been, has been in practice since 2004 and has been board certified neurology since 2009. She has served as subject matter expert in pain and stroke topics an item writer for the Neurologic Clinical Specialty Certification Exam, has served as a peer reviewer, conference presenter, and lecturer at university level um, on a range of topics. Deborah works in Chicago, focusing on low-income and minoritized um, populations with persistent pain and neurological conditions. So please welcome Deborah. Good afternoon. It is late. and. My brain definitely gets a little sleepy this time of day, so hopefully I can keep it fast and interesting and we're gonna have a fun intermission at some point. So today I am talking about intruding on the intrusion of pain, right? That is why everyone is here. Pain disrupts, it takes over. I cannot do the important things I want to do. And this is the only time you're going to hear me say the word chronic as it relates to pain, but chronic pain is chronic interruption. And that is really what drives the suffering and what brings people to us. I want to get back to living. I want to stop having to constantly think and worry about this intrusion. Right? So pain grabs our attention, it interrupts our thought, our task, and we start to worry and think about it until it resolves, right? So let's talk about attention and task interference. So classic motor control theories are really based on capacity, and in rehab settings, we talk about dual tasking, and things like stops walking while talking is a measure of fall risk in older adults. I do timed up and go tests, right? Stand up, walk three meters, turn around, walk back, sit down, and then I add a cognitive task. I'm supposed to be counting backwards by threes. I do animal naming. It is just as difficult for my patients, and we then measure the time difference between the two. But dual tasking and motor control models habituates. I can work on this with people and it will improve, right? And we can lead to an automatic performance of performing two tasks together in motor control models. But when we look at attention intrusion on pain, pain intensity really is the factor of disruption. And if we're talking about simple tasks, it's less disruptive, but in complex tasks, high intensity will be more intrusive than low intensity. And this does not habituate. You cannot practice an activity with pain and have that become one cohesive task that can be performed simultaneously. And it will continue to pull us as it persists. There are sensory and affective components to pain that pull us. Intensity, novelty, is am I about to get zapped by that researcher one more time? I know it's coming, right? And certainly affective components that uh, contribute to how attention is pulled during a pain experience, right? We'll see more vigilance, the more threatening we perceive it to be, anticipation, I know that this thing I'm about to do is going to hurt, it's coming, right? And certainly pain-related worry. How does this happen? Well, I really put this picture in because I thought the colors were very pretty. And I was like, ooh, right, like a moth to light. You don't really need, we're not gonna like dissect this deeply, but what I wanna point out to you, oops, wrong way. What I wanna point out to you is the, is it look burgundy to you? This darkest red, and down here this darkest blue. It's supposed to be like a navy and like a burgundy. 
these are the extremes of correlation and anti-correlation. So it's the on and the off of different networks in our brains. So burgundy is the fully positively correlated. So this is during uh, when college students who would like to make $20 uh, are given a heat stimulus to not quite burn them, but say, ow, uh, and have their brains looked at what networks turn on and what networks turn off. So what you're gonna notice here is we have dark red, whoops, sorry. Over here we have a nice dark red, we have a nice dark red. Here we have dark blue, it's supposed to be navy, dark blue, navy. Right here as we go down, we have a nice dark red over here. So what you're looking at is salience network, default mode network, and somatosensory over wow. here. So a little extraordinarily brief rundown. I took out the 12 slides that dissected this more deeply. You're welcome. <laughs> we have default mode network, which people misattribute all the time. And also, no, no, here's the other names you'll see these networks called. So if you're reading things and you're wondering, this is how it goes. So we have medial frontal parietal network, salience network, some people call it this or this or this, and central executive, right, the boss. And these are kind of the primary locations. Obviously, there's lots of other locations. This is kind of the biggest area in the brain it's associated with. So here we are again, 20-somethings, you know, saying, yes, please hurt me for $20 and what happens in these networks. So the gray line is the heat stimulus. It's like 95 degrees, something like that, right? So here, the gray line you're seeing here is heat. The blue line is the salience network, and the red line is default mode network. So here we have pain onset, salience network spikes at the first onset, first offset, and then a smaller increase at subsequent onsets, but continues to spike at each offset. Default mode network turns off, while salience network and somatosensory network are turned on. Then here again, we see this continuing of the turning off of the default mode network with each subsequent stimulus. Now this is even more interesting. So this is children with CRPS, and studying children who have CRPS is particularly important and, and helpful because they often resolve. So they, as a research paradigm, offer this example of having a persistent pain state that is very likely to resolve in several months to several years. So seeing how they respond while in their CRPS state versus once it has resolved can give us some really valuable information. So what you're looking at here, the red line is active CRPS. So these are kids who have CRPS right now. And the blue line is, is after their CRPS has resolved. And this is with brushstroke allodynia, okay? So salience network, while they have active CRPS, we see that initial, we see that spike at onset and offset with the first stimulus. But unlike those college students trying to make a buck, we continue to see this spike at onset additionally. And down here with default mode network, we see this is active CRPS. We kinda, it still kinda shows a little bit of this offset situation that we saw before. Now let's look at after their CRPS has resolved, they're now exposed to this brushing that previously was very painful. So in the salience network, what we see is the on, and then it goes real low, and then it goes on again, and it sort of doesn't really follow the exact same pattern that we saw previously. Default mode network, just kind of lingers, up, down, up, down, up, down. We don't see this big turning off of default mode. So what exactly are these things? Default mode network frequently gets inappropriately reduced to the mind-watering autopilot network. It's really about self-referential thinking. So that's how we get kind of this list of things relevant to default mode. 
theory of mind is the uh, emotions we attribute to others when we see them. And, they, and the default mode network has both task positive and task negative qualities associated with it. It is not always the turn off when activity is occurring situation. Salience network, right, a lot of us know this. This is about the assessment of risk versus reward, skill versus ability, and the value and ranking of information. And based upon how important the activity or task is, information stimulus will be amplified or dampened in order to work towards that goal pursuit, right? And of course, it you know goes through the sieve of life, right? All of these good stuff. And so what is happening in a pain experience is that the salience network is turning off the default mode network and turning on central executive, right? We are priming behavior to escape, right? That's what's going on. So let's look briefly at approach and withdrawal disruption. So there's an opponent process theory, and people apply this theory to other things, but in this case, we're gonna look at it as it relates to pain. That there is this pain uh, reward and aversion continuum. And then along that continuum, we find kind of this equilibrium, right? We find whatever balance, you know, as, as we exist and do and move and reinforce things that leads to this hedonic tone which is the equilibrium of emotional and motivational states, right? It's derived from the opposite values of reward and aversion. And we know that repetition is reinforcement, right? So if we keep practicing and, and performing and getting rewarded, we're, you know, and we repeat that process, that process strengthens. If aversion is what continues, right? Uh, this hurts, I'm gonna stop doing it. That process is obviously gonna strengthen as well. But with opponent process theory, they cannot coexist. And so as one process strengthens, the opponent process will weaken, right? And what that leads to is this dynamic that pain cessation is required for reward experience, right? We end up with a reversal of balance, right? What was once a positively balanced I move towards dynamic turns into a withdraw dynamic that becomes the positive, um, like you're approaching aversion, right? So the balance switches. And what we lead to then is this reward deficiency, anti-reward dynamic, anhedonia, things that used to bring us pleasure no longer bring us pleasure, right? Things that are aversive become more aversive. We approach pain avoidance. Avoidance becomes the reward, right? We end up in this anti-reward dynamic. And we end up in this reward deficit state, right? This hypodopinergic state and we experience increased sensitivity to pain and emotional stimuli and ongoing, you know, and an adaptation over time leads to the persistence of this reduction in dopamine. We have increased sensitivity in the remaining dopamine receptors and we get better at detecting aversive stimuli, right? So we're gonna pause here for a little while and do a little thing. I want all of you, if you have, I want you to dig in your bags and get out a piece of paper. Find a piece of paper, pen. If you don't have paper, I got some from the front desk and I have paper up here. So we're gonna find some paper and a pen and you can do this solo, but I would like for you to find a partner. What's that? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, perfect. Sarah's in, oh, thank you. So see if you can find a partner. We have, we have pens, markers, paper.
still looking around. All right. We are going to, well, you are going to doodle. And if you have a partner, you're going to do a collaborative doodle. And the way a collaborative doodle works is that you each take turns making a line or a squiggle or a thing of your choice, but you alternate and go back and forth. But we're all just gonna like, you know, take five minutes, four minutes, five minutes, and we're just gonna do a little doodling. If you have a partner, you are doing it together on one piece of paper. It is a collaborative doodle with your partner and you each build on each other's lines, okay? Yes. Don't overthink it, friends. Just have a good time with it. You don't need to plan it. You just need to let it go. I doodled on the slide for you. Some of these are my classic doodles I used to do in college. I feel like I need to check everyone's doodles. Right, we kind of just scribble. We play, maybe we do hearts. Maybe you like drawing eyes or hands or stars or curly cues or your name or initials. Friends watching virtually, I hope you're doodling as well. I'll give you one more minute to do it all. Thirty seconds, friends. Wind down your doodles. All right, let's go ahead and finish, finish your doodles. I love all the laughter that I'm hearing. I love all the socialization. But let's bring it back. <gasps> oh, 
<laughs> Some people are, are applauding their doodles. I love this. All right. Shh. <laughs> All right. I'm wondering if any of you would be willing to share how that felt, what came up for you, what emerged, what that experience, what, well, once you got through the awkwardness and you got into your collaborative doodle, how that felt to do, yes? Wow, a competitive doodle. I had no idea that was a thing, but now it is. I love that. Curiosity. It's like you read my next slide. Yes, Abby. And I, I said very clearly there were no rules. You're one of those. Yes. Oh, yeah, the Zentangle. Yeah, that's right. We did the Zentangle. That was too structured for me, FYI. No. Oh, we did a Zentangle. I heard a lot of laughter. Oh, go ahead. Over here. Amazing. So were they connected? Like, did you, like, did you just sort of, like, in some, like, mind meld way know that she was going to do a squirrel and you just, like, built on her squirrel drawing? And now you can read each other's minds. I'm very impressed. Yeah. You all have read my slides. Yeah. Yeah, and for some of you, did you start to notice you just started to just go with it? A little less consciousness and just sort of being in the moment and kind of letting it go. So the collaborative doodle, I will tell you, is something that my mom and stepdad used to do when I was a kid. And we were at some place and it got boring. My mom would dig through her purse for a scrap of paper. They'd each have a pen. And then they would each do a line. And what was great about it is that usually my stepdad had something in mind he was trying to draw, like a car. And that my mom would draw some line that did not fit with what he was intending to draw. So. Part of why I did the doodle we'll talk about later, but doing it collaboratively sort of added that social component that I think is really valuable. So, here's my mouse. So someone mentioned curiosity. We're gonna talk about curiosity later. But some of these elements, right? Creativity, immersion, Dr. Merriweather mentioned, they just kinda started getting deeper into it, right? Tuning out the outside world. Right? Maybe you were less aware of things in your body, like I'm hungry. Maybe people were more focused, right? If you were like drawing a squirrel or an elephant, like, wow, what do I need to do next? Right? You're not thinking about, does my foot hurt? It's what do I need to draw next? Right? Playful. I heard lots of laughter. Hopefully with that laughter, it elevated some moods up a little bit, right? And the immersion and creativity, obviously, right? These are all qualities associated with flow states. And a flow state is deep absorption. Deep absorption. If you've ever been so laser focused on something, artists, athletes, musicians, Creatives, right? Writers talk about the experience of flow states and this deep, intense focus at the exclusion of other stimuli, right? This is the opposite of pain intrusion, right? This is a deeply, deeply absorbing experience for people when they enter these flow states, right? They almost reach an internal neglect, right? It's intrinsically rewarding. 
And in flow states, what we see is that you see a match of high challenge with high skill. If the challenge is lower than the skill, then you will be bored and walk away from that. If the challenge matches the skill and brings you right to the edge of your skill, that is the match that helps keep it interesting for you. And if the challenge is less than the skill, then you're not gonna engage. If the challenge is more than the skill, you're gonna say, well, I can't do that, right? With this lack of intrusion, we see a decrease in stress and worry. We only pursue things that we think are important, right? It's something valuable. And I mentioned on this last slide, positive flow states are associated with positive affect or enjoyment, but also anger, right? If you've ever been like, I am going to get this IKEA furniture built. Or if you have small children, I'm going to get the shoe on right now, right? Certainly anger can get us into a deeply immersive state. So you end up, especially when you, you know, when I talked about creatives and athletes before, you can feel this high sense of focus with this almost automaticity, right? This maximal efficiency when you're in this deep flow state. And if we look at and look at side by side a flow experience versus a pain experience, we have the salience network deactivating the default mode network and activating the central executive network. The really high level big difference between them is that in flow, we have reward networks and parasympathetic drive. And in pain intrusion, we end up with that anti-reward experience I talked about before in sympathetic networks active. So when we talk about intruding on the intruder, right, and we know that repeated patterns are reinforced, the answer isn't about pain cessation in order to experience the opposite. Joy is, in fact, the process. Joy is how you do it. It is not the prize at the end of pain resolution. It is, in fact, how you intrude on the intrusion of pain. Someone mentioned curiosity before, right? Novelty, fun, right? All of these things help us learn and update and get better at something. I have small children, so things like play-based learning are something you hear a lot. Play-based learning is about making mistakes, doing it again, trial and error, and experimenting and getting better and better and better. Right? It is the implicit learning process. And the features of that are about joy and playfulness and fun and curiosity. So when I say joy is the process, I am not saying that just because I like talking about joy and it's the drum I've been banging on for a long time. It is, in fact, the process we should be engaging with more. So when we talk about novelty and curiosity, there's some other features of it that are really valuable. No prior expectation, right? Possibly less anticipation of pain, right? Cur novel, curious things draw us in. They can have a demand quality. What is that? What's happening over there? What is that thing, right? We lean into it. It has the, pos the opportunity to shift hedonic tone and motivational and emotional states and balance. It gives us opportunity to discover and rediscover. It can facilitate reflection, right? And we have reward potential. And it can help reduce unpredictability. And feeling things are predictable gives us security and safety, right? So the other fun thing about this doodle that you all engaged with is that you made art. 
Congratulations. And art is very much a thing that can help induce flow state. Art can be very immersive, right? And it can aid in expression and self-related experience. And research in art and producing art has told us that it can help increase resilience, self-efficacy, problem solving. And wouldn't you know it activates reward circuits, right? I heard laughter and giggles and questions and, well, this is silly, right? And congratulations, you all experienced a little extra connectivity in your medial prefrontal cortex. Can you feel it? Can you feel that extra connectivity? Which is the primary network in our default mode network, right? And the other thing that was super fun in one of the studies that is quoted up here is they actually compared free flow art, right? Here's your paper and paint or colored pencils versus coloring, like a coloring page, and doodling. And that doodling actually had the highest, had some of the best connectivity of the three. They were all success, they were all great, but doodling in particular. And so what we're gonna talk about now are how I do this in the clinic and how I've been doing this in the clinic for a very long time. This is the actual set of watercolors that I use and it's awesome and patients love it and I've had several patients buy it because they're like, well, this is so fun and I'm gonna do this. It folds up into just this nice little rectangle. These brushes kind of fill with water and it makes it easy just to be a little water. There's your paint. I use mandalas a lot. With people, it feels less confusing. Some people, you give them a blank piece of paper and they're like, well, I don't know what to draw. I don't know what to do. And so you can kind of rein in the options for them and go through and use some mandalas. And then this picture down here at the bottom is an app. It's a kaleidoscope app that people really enjoy and can feel really mesmerizing and fun. And then you can you can have it play back, right? After you've made your pretty kaleidoscope picture, you can play it and you can download it. And it's on the go because it's on their phone. The other way we can pull joy in, and these are actual pictures I've used with patients, is if I only have a few minutes at the end of my evaluation and I want to capitalize on that time with my patients, it's going to be centered around joy. And so I usually will ask them, what is something you really like, something you really love, right? Maybe it was something you used to do or just a thing that you like, right? And so all of these pictures are from actual patient encounters that we then went to Google and searched for some images and they picked the ones they liked and I put it in a Word document and printed it out in color and said, look at it several times a day, right? And then when you come back, well, you know, go from there. So this one right here, was a woman who was in her late 60s. She was Hispanic. We had the interpreter with us. Um, if you've ever heard me talk about Erica, our phenomenal Spanish interpreter, who is a cultural broker, and I could not do my job without her. She is amazing. And this patient told me that she didn't have any joys or hobbies or things. Uh, she had an older sister who, she, who was sick that she had to take care of her whole life. And then, you know, in her 20s, she got married, and then she had kids, and so that was just, like, never a thing. She never did activities in school, never really developed any interests. And I said, okay, but are there things you like? And she said to me, very specific, I really like in the spring when the trees start budding. I said, that's beautiful, I love that. And we went, we went through Google Images, we, she picked out ones she liked, I printed it out, and she looked at it and she goes, I really like this. I said, awesome, look at it several times a day, anytime you want. This one right here was a patient who is an artist, who had not been arting in a very long time. And when I asked her, and she felt a lot of shame about not, not producing art and would actually then not engage with other artist friends and former professors because she felt shame about not being able to engage in art. And so when I asked her, you know, what, are, what is something, 
that you've experienced or something you like or love. You know, she was really into animals, had a couple cats. Um, but what she mentioned is that she went, her and her ex-wife once went on a vacation in the Bahamas and that turquoise water, right? She's an artist. So that color, that memory of that turquoise water was really strong for her. And I go, did you know that in the Caribbean there are pigs that swim in the ocean? And she said, shut the front door. No, there are not. I said, oh yes, there are. And she was ever so delighted at all the pigs swimming in water pictures that we were able to print out for her. And she came back and she's like, I looked at it all the time. I said, I'm so glad. Um, I uh, have a lot of patients that like going stepping and going to white parties, so I have multiple handouts that have pictures of people stepping at white parties. This picture right here, this was about four-ish years ago. This patient still around in the periphery at my hospital. This is another amazing Erica the Interpreter story. I was the eighth physical therapist that this person saw. She was evaluated and the therapist said, I think you should go see Devra. So she comes over after her OT session. She has, I think, fibromyalgia, carpal tunnel, lots of aches and pains, walks with a cane. Um, very earnest, you know, very serious. And first words out of her mouth is, I don't know why my doctor had me come back. I've been here so many times. What are you gonna do that's different? Game on, lady. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> and Erica knows how things go with me. So I said, I totally agree. We're not going to do anything you've done before. Would you please laugh three times? <laughs> I said, and she, <laughs> and <laughs> she looks at me. She looks at Erica. She looks at me. She looks at Erica. And I go, would you please laugh three times? And Erica interprets it in her very animated interpretive way, which is very not what interpreters do. They're supposed to be very monotone, no, no voice inflection, right? So they miss all, all of that beautiful communication. But Erica knows better, and Erica is not afraid to get animated. And uh, again, the patient looks at me looks at Erica, looks at me, and then I go, ha, 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 and like, and Erica then does it, <laughs> and then, oopsies, what, oh, no, what happened here, and then the patient, like, starts laughing at us, right, <laughs> like, y'all are crazy, and then the fake laughter turned into genuine, contagious laughter because that is how it works. And still to this day, the therapists that were lingering nearby in the parallel bars or walking past with their patients still remember because everyone around us started laughing, right? So I think I proved to this lady that I was not, in fact, going to do what anyone else had done before. And then the next session, she told me I was laughing on the way home because I was, like, laughing at how ridiculous that was. I was like... Excellent. But this picture here, when I asked her, right, she's in her like late mid, mid, well, maybe early, late 50s, early 60s. I asked her, what is it, what is something you used to love, you know, and enjoy? And she goes, volleyball. Didn't even miss a beat. We start looking at volleyball pictures. She's like, no, no, no. And then she says to me, what I really like is when they make that face, when they're diving for the ball. Yes, ma'am. So we have two pages of people very earnestly diving for the volleyball. And then after I knew that I could find the pictures, I was like, this one? She goes, yeah, that one, no. So that's her. And sometimes we can couple that joy with some graded exposure, right? I can use their love of tattoos to have pictures of a body part that has tattoos. Um, I would say one of my very early patients with pain many years ago had burning in both of her hands. Really, like, we're talking, she would walk out of her house and jump in the swimming pool burning. And her husband was like, what are you doing? And she's like, I just can't stand it. But we could look at hand tattoos and tattoos on hands for 40 minutes, maybe not 40 minutes, but half an hour, and she would have no pain intrusion. Nothing, nothing pushed through her focus of these things that brought her joy 
that we were engaging with in an accessible way. And, right, look at, I don't know if you're familiar with this Pink Floyd poster I had it on my wall in college. I love it. I like bodies, I like painting, I like art. I'm like, this is so cool. So, so you know, you, I have certainly lots of pictures of people's bodies that are painted and art and this, that, and the other. And we can use that as part of our graded exposure for people. And then sometimes I turn the pictures sideways and upside down. Someone loved bowling. And so then we started rotating pictures on their papers. So this is the end. Is my time good? Oh, look at my time. I did so good. Um, we are, and we're done-ish, because now we can ask questions. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sarah. I know you all want to meet my interpreter, Erica, because she's the best. <laughs> Interpreters in general are the best. Oh, this, they are. Erica's extra. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any questions, comments, complaints, suggestions? <laughs> um, Quick question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is not something that most patients would expect. Do you ever get resistance? I mean, it sounds like you got a little bit, you give us some examples, but what are some of the strategies you might use to kind of get somebody on board with trying something like this when they are maybe a little resistant? Um, I would say that many of the people who end up in my arms are sent to me and have been primed. You need to go see Devra. She's not like other therapists. So there's that aspect. They already know they're coming for me to me for something different, number one. Number two, I, we talk about just like, let's do something really different while we're having a conversation. And I say, look, I have some really cool art supplies, right? And right then that engages some curiosity. You have art supplies. Let me, let me see what you got. Well, I got this, and I got that, right? So it's not, I haven't really had a lot of tension with it, with people, right? We can talk about it being something that's relaxing, right? Maybe you'll enjoy it. Really, what I, sometimes I'll get like, oh, well, I haven't done that since I was a kid. This feels weird, right? And then they start doing it. I'm like, well, you know, let's just do it for a little while. It's, a good, it's not going to hurt. So I haven't, you know... They already know that I do things different, so it hasn't happened that much. But you know, we can sort of just say, let's try something new and wild. Um, thank you. I, I enjoyed that very much, and the doodling and the competition of the doodling. Um, as it's, it feels like what you're engaging with with patients is very experiential. Um, but do you sprinkle in the education around? why you're doing it and what you're doing and the impact of joy? Are you, are you educating while you're engaging in this experiential practice? I... Thank you. Create, yeah, that's a great question. So what he asked was like, how am I educating and engaging as, as they're doing this? Because it's like this experiential thing. Well, I certainly ask like, what's coming up for you? How does this feel? Does this, right? Oh, it feels relaxing. Well, that sounds like a nice thing to feel. Right? Would you like to feel relaxed more often? This seems, you know, we've done this here together. You know, I, I have art supplies on the go, right? Here, look, I can give you this set of colored pencils. Let me print out more of those mandalas for you. There's some apps we can engage with. If feeling relaxed felt good to you, here we can make it portable, right? We're talking about intruding on the pain intrusion. And if um, the emergence of feeling relaxed and having a moment of, did you think about your pain when that was happening? And I'm like, well, no. And even if I, you know, there are patients that this may only, you know, they may only get a few minutes out of the, ex out of engaging with this before pain intrudes, but they still have that brief spot. And that experience of learning that they're in fact, are things that might be able to intrude, right? Things we really like, things that are salient to us, things that are important to us, 
right? Because everyone's trying to fix the issues in the tissues or the problem in their brain and then this, that, and the other. As opposed to you are feeling some kind of way and you don't like feeling that way, but we can help you feel a different way. And it doesn't have to look like what you think physical therapy should look like. It doesn't have to look medical. It can be joyful because that is the reward network, right? We are trying to intrude on the intruder. And if the most repeated pattern is the one that gets reinforced, then I need, I need to start disrupting the pattern we're trying to change. Right, yeah. For the online folks, the oh, question sorry. was how to bring that idea of joy and playfulness um, yeah. to perhaps what's considered to be more traditional physical therapy, like exercise and things like that. Um, I am always silly with my patients. <laughs> they know that I care for them deeply and I'm going to make jokes and I'm going to ask about their family member and I'm going to be fun because I like having fun, right? I want my patients to feel like they have fun with me, right, and that I care for them deeply, right, so there's going to be some contextual effects of that relationship, and my uh, friend who liked the face of the person diving for the volleyball, we certainly incorporated volleyball-esque things into the physical activities, right? We did some balloons back and forth that she had to dive for and made that face. Right? We had some rackets that you know, I could build up the handle so it didn't hurt her hand and you know, whacking things back and forth and going, Ugh, you know, like how tennis players do. So I would say think of it in a more abstract way and less of a, you know, it doesn't have to be as literal, right? It has to be playful, right? Curious and joyful. Any other thoughts or questions? Oh, oh we have one online. Flag. Like it. <laughs> oh, that lovely talk as always. Uh, so we have a question from AJ. Uh, they actually have two questions. Uh, one, I have mostly learned about hyperfocus as a facet of neurodivergence, especially ADHD and autism. Do you know if the research on flow states that you presented was done with neurotypical people or a mix of folks? And if there are any differences based on neurotype of what is happening in the brain during the flow state? Um, question two is, what are your thoughts on pacing and flow states, especially for people who often have flare up later, uh, long after an activity? I, I, I'm gonna answer the first one first, and then I'm gonna have you repeat the second question. Sounds good. So the first one seemed to be about people who have like attention deficit disorder, right? Things like that in flow states, is that correct? Uh, yes, so they just want to know if the research is done about flow state, is that done mostly on neurotypical people or is the mix of uh, subject recruitment? Um, flow state research really runs the range of uh, researching populations who experience a lot of flow states, right? So artists, athletes, musicians, writers. Um, flow state research also is about inducing flow state, right, and attentional networks. And when you start diving into attention research, certainly it specifically will look at people who have a, a deficits in their attention networks and stuff. So there's, there's sort of this spectrum and you know when you some of the creativity research actually dives into um, into rehabilitation and people who have injuries to their creative centers in their brain, right? Or even when you look at people like with Parkinson's who are now getting dopaminergic medications and looking at their art output, and that is. What they've, in that particular population, it's like a little less about flow and more about the compulsion that can happen 
sort of with flow states also. So flow states are also looked at in gaming, right? That's part of why like video games, right? And they're also looking at flow states related to like transcranial direct current and transcranial magnetic stim, right? Can I excite the prefrontal cortex or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and induce and prime this? So I would say it's all over the place. What was, Edie, what was the second uh, one? So actually part two of the first question is um, with regard to the flow states, are there any differences based on the neural types and what's happening in the brain during the flow state? Um, I mean, it certainly activates the salience and, you know, th first of all, when we look at networks and we look at patterns in brain areas, we don't have carbon copy brains, right? So there's gonna be some nuance and variation. Um, it's hard, you know, it's not like you can go in and see every single scan that they do. So it's, it's a tough question to answer because it's, not, they don't kind of dive into that, you know what I mean? But would you say generally it's the same area that's being activated and regulated? Right, that's why the salience right. network, default mode network, central executive network. Okay, so the second pathways. question is, what are your thoughts on pacing and flow states, especially for people who often have flare-ups after the activity? So pacing and flow states I would consider very different things, and I wouldn't necessarily if I'm, I'm not necessarily looking to induce a flow state with my patient, but I am certainly taking what I not, what I understand about how opposite it is from pain intrusion and taking those features related to joy, right, and how hedonic tone changes and how our approach behavior changes and how it can help us tune out and sort of neglect interoceptive information. So if a pain thought emerges through some joyful activity, then that's, then that's what goes, right? That's, we're learning about how their system responds to that thing. And then we figure out, can you take a break? Do you need to switch positions? Do you need to do a thing, right? The salience of whatever that information was and how it was brought to consciousness is really what we would investigate. Maybe it's like, I really need to go to the bathroom. I drank so much water on the way over here, right? So because a, f a flow state doesn't necessarily mean that like, when, when you guys were doodling, you were not necessarily in a flow state, but we were working on those networks. Does that help? Does that answer the question? I guess we'll find out. I, I kind of have a personal question to follow oh. up on that, if that's okay. Yeah, um, we're seating. And now I lost my thought. Uh, so like often like you hear clients come to you and it's like, and you do, we do a lot, as an OT, we do a lot of exploration work. And they get into state, they do it, and then next time you see them and like, did you enjoy it? Yes, but I paid for it the next day or next two days. I think that's kind of what they were getting at and how do you, I think you kind of answered the question, setting their expectations. Could you ask again, but maybe without the mask? I feel okay. like it's making it a little muffly. Sorry. Um, is this better? So like having clients coming the next time, like after you do this activity the first time, and they say, oh, I paid for it for the next day, next two days, because like how much pain or how much uncomfortable I was in because I was in the flow state, so I wasn't experiencing this, but after that, I'm paying for it. Um, so it's not, it's not scripted. It's not like I say, go do this for 10 minutes. It's really about their choice to approach or not approach it, right? We, we do it together. They enjoy it. We highlight what they note as being valuable to them about the experience and how it helped them feel a thing they enjoyed feeling and giving them the tools to choose to do that at home or not choose to do it at home. They don't owe me compliance of a home exercise program or doodling. If they like it and it was sufficiently valuable and balanced for them, then it will be pulled in as a tool that they like and they use. So it either is something, right? And maybe we just need to tweak it or modify it. Dr. Merriweather. Yes, yeah, so I, this is probably more an editorial and a, and a thank you um, for 
walking us through this. And I think we want to be evidence-based and we want to hone in on, you know, what the therapeutic dose of everything is, right? But I think what's being run through that you've brought to the forefront, and thank you, is the fact that, first of all, you're dealing with folks who are not encouraged to think about joy all the time, right? That's number one. You have an interpreter that's kick ass. Thank you for that as well. <laughs> um, She's the best. And I think when we're, as we're compiling the evidence, I think these pictures and these images show that joy looks different for a lot of people, even within the same group, right? And so the individualization component of this, supported by evidence of the default mode networks and all of that, which you know more about than me, I know just enough to be dangerous, but I do know that that evidence is growing and what I hope to see is that it's growing in the direction of, you know, what joy is for people that are not encouraged to even think about joy. Yes, totally agree. So thank you for your work and, as, and thank you for your time. And I will get off this mic now. Thank you for thanking me. <laughs> that was the best close the ever. Best. Um, okay, thank you for that. So thank you again. Thank you. Deborah.